Do you see in your ideal future a state for all Kurds in all the countries in which they, they are, or autonomy within the countries in which they are? How, I mean, just get utopian for a moment. What would you like Well, no, to I think there? it's quite important not to demand, if you, if you take a position of solidarity with some national movement, as for example, I mean, Edward Said and I produced a book of essays on the Palestine question back in 1982 before the last intifada. And I've spoken countless times about this and written a lot about it, but I, I, I never want to take a position that is more militant, if you like, than the, than the friends I have in this other movement. It seems to me for them to decide if they can compromise or not, not for me. Um, and so when the, when, the, when the Iraqi Kurdish leadership says, as it now does, it's content to be Iraqi, to say we are, we are Iraqis, but we, are, but we insist on being regarded as Kurds and granted autonomy, uh, I don't think that's a betrayal, no. Um, and since the uh, Kurds in the neighboring countries also uh, don't demand that they all be fused into one state, um, I don't feel that I'm being uh, unduly moderate either. I think, and I think that's probably a fairly good rule of thumb. But I think they would be as justified in demanding a state as any other national minority with a common language and culture would be. And it's very much to their credit that they're willing for the sake of a peaceful agreement to, and to give up uh, quite a lot of their dignity and quite a lot of their history to regimes that, you know, in the past, good, good and sufficient reasons in the past, they have no right, no, sorry, no reason to trust. I think you were going to say in the answer to my question before this that there was another formative experience for you. Um, well, there was. I just want to say one more thing about the Kurds before we're done. Hmm. Um, these guys are for regime change, okay? My Kurdish comrades are. They've been for it for a very long time. They've been fighting for it for a very long time. They've lost swaths of population fighting for it. They're not going to be cheated of it. They think this time they can get rid of Saddam Hussein. They have many brave Iraqi friends willing to join them on this. My solidarity is with them in case anyone wanted to ask me about it. Okay. I am for, and have always been for, those Kurds and Iraqis fighting for the overthrow and destruction of the Saddam Hussein regime. I was for regime change before any Bush family member was for it. And if necessary, I'll be for it long after they give it up. But I'm for it, okay? And I'm... Well. The other one was Bosnia. I had to go... I felt I had to go to Sarajevo during the siege of Sarajevo in 1992. And I hope no one will think I'm being Eurocentric if I say that having seen terrible things before in, in Kurdistan, among other places, and Southern Africa, and so forth, that I was kind of shocked to see a, a city in, in Europe uh, being reduced to rubble and beggary um, and destruction and its population put to the sword um, in the 90s. I hadn't, I hadn't think, I hadn't thought rather, I didn't think I would have to endure that, let alone that they would have to, and the inhabitants of Mostar and many other cities too. And uh, bad as that was to see the Serbian Orthodox Christian uh, racists uh, trying to destroy Muslim Bosnia, but also the Catholic uh, Christian Croatian fascists colluding with them in this operation, and with NATO colluding in the partition of Bosnia and dis dismemberment and destruction of Bosnia between these two forces. And it seemed to me quite uh, essential that, the, that the Europe, having watched the destruction of the Armenians uh, by Turkey, in the early part of the century, and then seen the attempt to destroy the whole of European Jewry made by German imperialism in the middle of the century, could not end the century by saying, well, let's have a Muslim minority destroyed too before we get the 20th century over with. To watch that would be impossible. And the fact remains that it was only by a tremendous struggle within the United States to change opinion in Congress and in the, and in the government that the necessary force was mobilized to prevent that from happening. And if that had not been done, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo would now be a howling wilderness, a post-genocidal howling wilderness. And again, in case anyone wanted to ask me about this, I'll state for the record, I don't regard that rescue operation as having been American imperialism. One... <clears throat> yeah. One theme I see running through what you've written is uh, an extreme dislike of organized religion. And uh, 
I've heard you quoted as saying that uh, if you died and went to heaven, you would be aghast to find that there was one. Uh, <laughs> and recently, uh, I think you said or wrote that for you, the real axis of evil is uh, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. <laughs> well. As they say on exam essay questions, expand and explain. Um, being religious is like living in North Korea. Um, you have endless opportunities to praise the leader, to thank him for giving you everything, to thank him for looking after you, to thank him for all his boundless gifts, to thank him for all the, his tireless efforts on your behalf. Um, a celestial North Korea is what the religious believer wants. But there's, there is there's one, I suppose there are two differences. Um, you can defect from North Korea. <laughs> and you can die and just cease to exist in North Korea. But if you're a religious believer, the leader goes on persecuting you after you're dead. You have to go on praising him forever and thanking him for being born and for all this. This is servility squared. It's the, it, is, it is the slave mentality. It's contemptible and cowardly. And, it's, it, and it's, it's the enemy of the intellect. It's the enemy of free inquiry. It's the enemy of reason. Um, and what I would add is that those who practice it or preach it additionally piss me off by pretending that they're humble about this. They say, Well, don't mind me. I'm just on an errand for God at the moment. Um, I'm extremely modest about this. I'm very humble and abject. It's, um, but it's just that God wants me to be doing this. Um, and the reason why I'm ecumenical about it, I suppose, is because all of them partake of the same illusion. All monotheisms particularly partake of, of the same uh, absurdities. And the Quran, uh, um, I regard as especially horrible because it validates both the claims of Christianity and of Judaism. I mean, the, the, the Quran insists that Jesus was a real prophet and so was Mo, so were Moses and Abraham. So there you have the whole horrible thing in, in plain view. And the name of the religion, Islam, is simply the word for surrender, as it should be. And the posture of it is one of surrender and abjection, as it should be. And this is poison, frankly. And um, I, have, I have nothing but contempt for it. And in case you wonder if I can tell the sinner from the sin, I can, but I have a slight contempt for the people who believe it, too. But if they keep it in the home where it belongs, I don't mind. Uh, you've written that for you the September 11th attacks were a big turning point. Uh, tell us about that. Well, I've, I've, wrote, I've written that I think it's, the cliché is true that September 11th is a big turning point, that it did alter a number of things, and I don't dissent for once. I mean, I like to always think, well, what's wrong with the, the prevailing cliché or the prevailing wisdom? But in this case, I thought, well, that, that's true. That's, that's uh, what the Germans call a tendons vendor. It's a turning point. Uh, for me, I, I, it wasn't that much of one on the essential question. I thought that the 14th of... Um, February 1989 was the turning point. And that was the day when uh, my friend Salman Rushdie received a, a directly uh, incited threat of murder, uh, accompanied with an offer of bounty. In other words, murder solicited for pay in public, in his own name, from the theocratic leader of a foreign state, of which he, he Salman, was not a citizen for writing a novel. And if you like, I'll say all that again. Some people forget what the fat law was. I, the Ayatollah Khomeini, will offer money for your murder for writing a novel. And I'll also offer a ticket to paradise to anyone willing to attack you or those who helped you with the book. Um, and I thought, well, there you have it. A, a perfectly arranged collision between all the things I hate and um, all the things I quite like. Uh, the things I quite like, by the way, are free expression, the right to write novels without death threats, and so on. Um, and I remember President Bush the next day was asked, um, did he have a comment on this? And he said, no, why should he? Uh, this is President Bush Sr. As far as he, were, he was concerned, no American interests were involved. And I remember Susan Sontag pointing out, well, it would be paltry to say 
Mr. Rushdie's then wife was an American who'd had to go into hiding with him. Um, might it perhaps be said that American interests were involved in, say, the protection of novelists from state-supported terrorism? Anyway, you don't get that now. You wouldn't get that kind of sappy, stupid comment now because the long period of underreaction to um, theocratic fascism is now over. But until September the 11th, what I thought was that there was a great deal of underreaction to it and a, a, an unwillingness to confront it, an unwillingness to confront the threat that it represents, an unwillingness to realize how ruthless it was, how much it means business for us, uh, how certain its defeat is, by the way, but how absolutely we must uh, hurry that defeat along. What about the other... Um what about the other two religions in your axis of evil there uh, and the well, the theocratic fascist tendencies yes. that they occasionally... Not alone uh, did the President Bush show indifference that day, but um, the same day, um, Cardinal O'Connor of New York, a great prince of the church, announced that the problem was not the offer of money for murder by a religious leader, but the problem was profanity on the part of the author. He was joined in this by the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, by the Osservatorio Romano, the Vatican newspaper, and by the Sephardic chief rabbi of Israel. In other words, there was a wonderful reverse ecumenical um, uh, lineup of, of characters, all of whom said the problem is not the offer of murder um, for, for the destruction of literature, the problem is profanity. And I thought, well, I'm very glad that you guys have all sort of, as it were, clustered together because there'd be more of a chance of getting you all with one grenade. Okay. Okay. I want to move on to the and Then you could make them into fertilizer, and then that'd be the first honest day's work they'd done in their lives if you spread them on the fields. <laughs> I want to move on to the subject that I think is on, on everybody's minds these last few months in the U.S., which is the possible war with Iraq. You have at times voiced general support for the prospect of going to war with Iraq. Are you still feeling that way? Under what circumstances? What would change it? Spell out your position for us. Well, in the first place, I'm not for a war with Iraq, and I don't think there will be one. I have no quarrel with the Iraqi people or with the Iraqi nation, and I don't believe anyone else uh, here does. However, there is going to be a confrontation with the Saddam Hussein regime, and it's being forced upon us. And the consequences, um, in my opinion, will occur uh, whether or not there is a fight, because the Saddam Hussein regime is already imploding because of its own horrific internal character. And the, the dam of hatred and chaos and havoc that has built up behind the Ba'ath Party dictatorship, accumulated behind it over the last many years, will burst and spread in any case, so that you have two alternatives. Watch that happen and wonder what will occur, or intervene and see if you can try to condition it. Now, it seems to me that the second choice is the obvious one, and that um, those who've worked so patiently and bravely to bring this about should be the people we're working with. Um, I mean by that, the, the, uh, particularly the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, the PUK, but the, the Kurdish rebels in general, and the Iraqi national Congress. This should be a, not just a priority for the United States government, but it should be a priority of those citizens in the, of the United States who consider themselves committed to human rights. If they imagine that just by watching it or staying neutral, they can, as it were, avoid or escape the consequences, they are quite clearly wrong. The, the Saddam Hussein regime has staked everything on the acquisition of the weapons of genocide. And if it was to acquire them, we know what it wants them for. It is also the sponsor of a great deal of international gangsterism. We're not qu completely certain of the extent of its connection with Mr. Bin Laden. We know Mr. Bin Laden supports Saddam Hussein. Uh, it's interesting. We don't know if Mr. Saddam Hussein necessarily supports Mr. Bin Laden, but we know that the suicide bombers are supported and encouraged and paid for from Iraq. We know the Abu Nidal organization, which committed many murders among the Palestinian leadership, uh, was supported and endorsed from, from Iraq. And we also know that there is a case, a quite clear case to be made against Saddam Hussein for war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity. And the United States government, were it not for its protection of Kissinger, would, would and should be bringing that case before the United Nations and the International Court of Justice. 
But those who care about these things should be pressing for more action and more careful action and more, and more action based upon the principles of human rights and not less, and not being neutral about it. But here, okay, both, both you and George Bush are talking about war with Iraq to eliminate Saddam Hussein. But beyond that, I sense that there are two different wars you're talking about. You're talking about, uh, you know, guaranteeing autonomy for the Kurds, pluralism, democracy, and so forth. But are those the purposes of Bush's war? And are the people that Bush is wanting to work with the same people that you would be wanting to work with to reconstruct uh, Iraq after the war. After all, uh, the general in uh, Denmark who got arrested a couple of days ago, General Nizar uh, Khazraji, who was one of the people, I understand that the Bush people had tipped to lead an army in Iraq post Saddam Hussein, he's now been indicted for his role in the gassing of the Kurds in the 1980s. So are you and George Bush talking about two different wars here? Um, there, there is a faction of the administration that would be happy just to have a military coup. Just to have a... Just to have a military coup yeah. in, in, um, in Baghdad. Um, and has been working along those lines and, as you say, isn't very choosy about who it picks and would settle for a military government. After all, that's what the CIA always does best. We can usually find you a general willing to take over. They haven't actually succeeded in that in this case. It wouldn't be the worst thing. It would be better than the status quo, and it would at least lead to an invitation to the inspectors and others to come in and, and identify and destroy the sites where weapons of genocide are being incubated. But no, you're quite right. It wouldn't satisfy me or the long-suffering Iraqi or Kurdish people. And then there's another thing uh, which the administration won't say, but I know is split about. I mean, what this really is, is a war against Saudi Arabia. That's why the Saudis are so against the regime change in Iraq, and that's why they won't even let the base the United States built for them be used for it. <coughs> because they know that with Saddam gone, their buffer state and client is gone, and they also know that with the recuperation of Iraqi oil, their oil monopoly and oligopoly in the region which the, with which they've helped to spread bin Ladenism around the globe, is gone. And I can't wait for that bit to happen either. I accept the logical and probable consequences of this, in other words. There's going to be some terrific domino effect here. Sometimes people, you hear people on the left saying, well, it might destabilize the region. And I say, well, I've heard worse words than instability, actually, when it comes to the Saudi monarchy, for example. And the, the, there's an extraordinary boldness on the part of a wing, at least, of the uh, Republican intellectuals in that they've decided to make war on what they used to think of as their status quo. And I don't think that the, uh, the sheer drama and interest of that and the possible excellent consequences are sufficiently discussed. Well, if you talk about destabilizing the region, don't the recent election results in Pakistan and Turkey make you think that if things get riled up, it could, in fact, strengthen the forces of, of Muslim fundamentalism? No, I don't, because um, for three reasons. One, well, there's, well first, there's, there's, there's a general reason which would apply to all of them. Um, even if these forces are elected, uh, they will find you can't run a society out of the Quran. Um, it can't, or any other holy book. It can't be done. It's been tried many times. It's a repeated failure. Uh, the most encouraging sign of this is the way that the Iranian people are already emerging on the other side of theocracy. Uh, they've, they've thrown it off, especially the younger generation. They've repudiated it so far peacefully, and so far, I'm glad to say, without any outside help. It's the most single encouraging thing in the Middle East. That's why you never, never hear the peace movement types talk about the Iranian street. Uh, the Iranian street is about 70 million people. It's nearly as big as the Arab street, but people don't talk about it because the Iranian street is 100% pro-US policy, anti-Saddam Hussein, and anti-Mullah in the region. And we can hope for great things from that. Uh, by the same token, um, the, the Turkish electorate is simply having an election in which a party that has an Islamic inflection has won and is allowed a peaceful transition of power. That absolutely proves the secular character of Turkish society. It's a very encouraging development. 
Um, and so, no, we, we, we can have the confidence that we are right about this. Only a secular society can guarantee freedom of religion, and uh, only a secular society can offer any hope of progress, and the people will find that out either by learning it or, or finding it out from bitter experience. Uh, last August, you wrote the following. What the Iraqi and Kurdish Democrats would like is American aid for an endorsement of their own efforts to replace the regime. And what they fear is what I also fear, a heavy-handed US attack, which results in an Iraqi puppet government that is designed to placate the Saudis and the Turks. Now, have you changed your feeling on that point? Are you more optimistic that uh, this is not going to happen? Well, no, that's, that, Adam, that's the earlier question you asked, but in a different way, or rather, as I might have asked it, as I might have answered it, excuse me, uh, some time ago. I just think the situation has moved on from that now. It's very obvious that neither the Turk I'm sorry, it's very obvious that neither the Saudi authorities nor the Turkish military ones um, want such a thing to happen, and that if it does, it will be therefore by definition overruling them. Um, but it's also become much plainer uh, that there's no status quo that can be protected by a non-intervention policy. In other words, if you don't intervene, if no one intervenes. The Saddam Hussein regime will collapse and bring great chaos and havoc in its wake in any case. It was very striking, I thought, to see the other day what happened when after... Oh, the prisons. When after humiliatingly forcing the Iraqi people not just to vote for him 100%, but to turn out for him 100%. I mean, to, to abnegate them and humiliate them one last time and force them to treat him like a god uh, and put them through, through that disgusting experience that he said, well, let's open the jails, at least the jails that contain the rapists and pickpockets and pimps and murderers. In other words, I suppose the people he thought were his natural constituency. <laughs> and find that within hours, the guards and the warders at the prison were helping to break down the bars and the walls and let, down, let out everybody, or at least everybody they could find. Because most of the families who came to the prison gates found that their loved one isn't on the list of detainees, has been probably sawn in half on a table and a video made of it for his family some time ago. Um, and there were spontaneous demonstrations in the streets not long after that. And the police quite clearly had no instructions about how to deal with them. That's the, sh that's the Nikolai Ceausescu moment. That's the moment when the man's made his last mad speech from the balcony. He's beginning to go nuts, to beginning to consider concessions. It means it's over, morally, and it's about to be over politically. The only question is, are you going to help with the intervention, or are you going to be neutral about it? And I've, even though I've tried to hedge in what you quoted me as saying a few months ago, uh, I was at least clear on what side I was on. What about the factor of oil? I mean, would Bush be so eager to launch this war if what Iraq had the world's uh, first or second largest proven reserves of was, say, potatoes rather than oil? Um, the Cheney Energy Plan, the one that the Enron folks helped him write, uh, has the U.S. rising, of course, spurns all talk of alternative energy, and has the U.S. rising to importing two-thirds of its oil by the year 2020. And uh, Ahmed Shalabi, whom Rumsfeld and Cheney seem to want to install as the leader of Iraq, told the Washington Post recently, American companies will have a big shot at Iraqi oil. And the Heritage Foundation has already put out a detailed plan for privatizing Iraq's oil industry, uh, mostly into American hands. Uh, does that concern you? Um, my view has always been you should never be deterred from doing the right thing by the thought that it might also be in your interests. The, sorry, didn't hear that? No. I'll say it again. You should never be deterred from doing the right thing by the thought that it might also be in your own interests. There's only one country that can hope to uh, rebuild the uh, Iraqi oil industry. Let's be realistic. Um, the, Iraqi oil, the, the Iraqi oil industry is now working on stuff that's about 20 years out of date. Probably they could pump twice as much oil as they do now with, with an overhaul just of the equipment that they're using. It would take a few billion in a couple of years, but it could be done. And it would no longer be oil just being drilled for the, for the feeding and keeping of a, a barbaric military and party elite who use it to finance aggression 
and genocide. The only country that's capable of this undertaking is the United States. The French won't do it because, or rather, I hope Mr. Chalabi doesn't let them do it, because they've been bribed by Mr. Saddam Hussein up till now, as have the Russians, um, with, uh, with oil contracts in the other direction. Yes, there's going to be some hardball played about that. But it's very essential, it seems to me, that the oil resources of the region be not in the hands of someone who threatens to blow them up or to irradiate them if his rule is challenged. In other words, do you want to see what it would be like for the world economy if he was in a position uh, to threaten or to do that or to repeat what he did to the Kuwaiti oil fields last time when I remind you he set them on fire while on his way out? This is the question people have to, not, you hear people say, no war over oil. Are they listening to what they're saying? What they're saying is oil isn't worth fighting about. Who really believes that? Come on, be serious, get real. So that's, wait, wait, that's impressive. That's six people who really believe that. That's, six, that's amazing. I'm amazed there are six people in America who think oil isn't worth fighting over, but lots of luck. But wait a minute, you're saying that the oil is worth fighting over? I'm saying it's essential uh, to fight over it, yes. I'm saying it's essential that it not be the possession of, of a maniacal, uh, sabotaging despot, yes. All right, but are there not better alternatives to it than it, uh, than it being in well, possession you know, of American oil Are companies? we going to do wind power now, um, Adam? I mean, I'm willing to talk about alternative energy, if you like, but that's not the question we're being faced with now. Well, you, I, I mean, if, if, you're, if you're asking me, while we wait to see what Saddam Hussein wants, shall we talk about solar panels? I guess we could, but I think it would be a rather insipid conversation. Okay. All right. But. Okay. We're going to open things up to microphones on the floor in a second, but I want to get in another question or two first. Mm -hmm. um, all right. I want to come back to the oil thing, but look at the larger context in which Bush's war push is taking place. Uh, my fear is that the